Welcome, everybody. This is Chris J. Snook. I am here with Token Standard Live and my esteemed guest, Rebecca Costa, for those of you who are familiar with her work, you're in for a real treat. For those of you who are not, you have no idea that the level of treats you're going to get today. Uh, Rebecca, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me, Chris. Good to see you again. It's unbelievable that it's been six years since we last saw each other, but I, I think that you just gotten younger and smarter um, and I've gotten less hair. So, you know, there's that. <laughs> well, it's better that it's not the other way around and I don't have less hair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is definitely true. That, that, so, that would be a real treat for everybody, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's funny. So we, um, so we'll dive right in. We'll we'll honor everybody's time, uh, as you know. Um, but we'll we'll just clarify for the viewers as well. We care about three audiences here, serving three audiences here. The purpose of Token Standard and Token Standard Live is is not to inundate you with more stuff uh, to consume your day, but to try and be very um, thoughtful and efficient with how we deliver you the less. Uh, uh, the more of the less that matters, as we like to say. So um, with with an audience of what we call smart money and and people that are managing large portfolios and trying to figure out where capital is flowing next, uh, with C-level executives that are trying to understand for their industry and also for their enterprise, what decisions and what unintended consequences may come by the decisions they do or don't make. And then lastly, for those who are executing and building the new products or the technology stacks that are ultimately running our lives, uh, that DevOps crew, as we like to call it. Those are the three audiences that we care most about and that we try and serve. And I couldn't think of a better person to start this series off with than you because you've defined complexity as having more wrong choices than right ones. And so as we sit here over the next you know year or however long and, and look to help people make better decisions, I thought, why not start out with a person who says you're not going to have as many right ones to make anyway. So welcome to the show. Talk to me a little bit about that. Why, why is that true? Well, I think everybody could agree that, you know, things that used to be very, very simple are very complex right now. Our, our brains don't evolve at the same pace as social progress. And so uh, while our brains might understand a simple thing like barter, you know, meeting each other in the street and I have some eggs and, and you know, you have some carrots and we bicker back and forth until we both agree on a price, we make a trade, and we both think we got the better of the deal. That's pretty much what the human brain is capable of understanding. What we don't know is, what we don't understand today are uh, derivatives and, you know, <laughs> and, and some of the highly complex uh, financial instruments. Even people on Wall Street or financial uh, experts are having a hard time uh, understanding how currencies are really valued um, and uh, and why uh, all stocks drop at the same time. As you know, I, I write about in the Watchman's Rattle, that doesn't make any sense at all. All companies didn't lose value at the same moment at the same day, right? right. So we're not really understanding how all of this works. And if you talk to the experts in the world, um, much of this is just, uh, as uh, uh, Greenspan said, it's it's based on ex irrational exuberance and irrational fear and some very primitive emotions. So when things become more complex than the human brain was designed to uh, and has evolved to really be able to comprehend and manage in a rational fashion, uh, we become highly confused between what is an empirically proven fact and what is a unproven belief. And this has been something that has occurred throughout human history, uh, as you know, uh, because sometimes I feel like you know my books better than I know them, to be honest. Just because I've read them about 10 times, I think. I know. I know. So it's always tricky to have an interview like this. Yeah, whenever I whenever I do whenever I do talks anymore, I, I say, listen, I can brag about everything I'm going to say because none of these ideas are actually mine. And then I start quoting, you know, you and Gerd Leonhardt and people that we're going to have on the show. So I. Um, All right. So, I, you know, I, I have to be careful when I when I say something because I, I, you know, I'm I'm. I'm in danger of being corrected on my own book uh, here, but, never, but throughout never. human history, whether it's the Mayans, the Khmer, the Ming Empire, the Egyptian Empire, we see that there is a point in time at which the complexity of day-to-day -day life and the public policy decisions they have to make exceed their capability to get a grasp and a handle on the empirical facts. And so when that happens, 
public policy becomes highly irrational, leaders become highly irrational, and that sort of sets the stage for some catastrophic event to set the uh, civilization into collapse. Now, by collapse, as you know, I do not mean everybody will die. Um, uh, I think that's an important thing because I actually, I, I think of collapse and, and as much as I like to think about myself as someone who's weighing, and I'm definitely an optimist, I, I will tell you that I, I get fearful. I mean, I, I do. I, I, I sit there and I recognize that I'm fearful and then I can choose you know, how I want to deal with that. But um, then I also recognize that maybe other people don't recognize that they're fearful. And then I get more fearful that they're going to react to do something I'm going to have to deal with. Right. So so collapse is a big word. Like I, I want to make sure. Yeah, yeah. OK, so, you know, when I I'm a scientist, so when I use certain words, I don't have an emotional uh, intent with right. that word. I, you know, uh, <laughs> so and, and that makes me a bit insensitive sometimes when I'm speaking. So let me clarify what collapse is. Collapse is simply a reversal to easier systems, to more simple systems. That's all. If we have an e a global economic collapse, which we will, uh, it's nothing to fear. It just simply means we're going to, uh, for a period of time, go back to bartering, and then we'll work our way back on up until uh, until we reach systems that we're capable of understanding and managing in a rational fashion. So it doesn't mean people are going to die and it doesn't mean they'll be shooting in the street or, or, or anything. Just imagine tomorrow that there's a, a the worst case scenario, a massive global financial collapse. What is it going to mean? You'll still go home. Your wife and children will be there. You have some canned goods, hopefully, in your pantry. So, you know, you're not going to starve. Uh, maybe there'll be a, a temporary disruption in, in power. Uh, but not for more than a few days, and then we'll get it together. Um, and then, you know, we'll try to correct whatever caused the financial collapse, and and we'll move forward. This is this is the history of humankind, right? Civilizations collapse throughout the history of humankind, and it didn't mean the end of humanity. Right, and I think this is why I've always enjoyed your scientific yet um, – thoughtful approach to explaining these things because there's really, there's, there's polarity that exists, right? There's the collapse, uh, go get guns, ammo, gold, silver, um, you know, water, because it's going to be apocalyptic zombie land, you know, and you need to be prepared, right? The prepper movement, which I don't think there's anything wrong with, but I'm saying like, there's that fear like response. And then there's the response of just apathy and ignoring and like, you know, hope and prayer, like that we can keep built, printing trillions of dollars and, you know, we're spending a billion and a half in interest a day right now in the U.S. So like that we can keep just doing that and, and keep consuming at the current level and that we don't have to think about it. And then there's like the optimistic, you know, emerging entrepreneur slash unsophisticated investor that's like, oh, well, as soon as it all collapses, everyone's going to move into Bitcoin or cryptocurrency, um, which is actually potentially, you know, an interesting uh, future state look at what currencies could be. But in my opinion, again, has more friction and more complexity at its current state than the current system. And so not likely to be a move to simplicity or a flight to quality right out of the gate. So help us make sense of this, because I have a feeling when this happens, you're going to get a lot of downloads. <laughs> well, well, first of all, let us look at collapse in a in a more positive way. OK, a, a, a collapse is a correction. It's a correction. And as with any correction, whether it's large or small, it depends on the degree to which you've adapted, right? So if you adapt and mitigate successfully along the way to change, the severity of the final correction might be rather minor and insignificant. It's a failure to adapt at the rate at which change is occurring that causes the final correction to be severe and highly disruptive. So if you're changing, if you're making those changes along the way, if you're successfully adapting, then the change in the environment or whatever change is causing the disruption is not going to be uh, particularly difficult to, to, to get through. Um, and so I think that's one way to look at it. And I think that one of the reasons you're doing these podcasts is to help people keep up with the pace of change. 
you know, to adapt at a uh, at at the rate at which change is occurring, and to the extent that you can do that, like by leveraging technology, we're going to talk about this in a little bit. Artificial intelligence, you know, the the tools that are available. To the extent that you can keep up with that, then you will be better prepared for whatever that correction is, and you may be able to mitigate it to the point where the correction is really no big deal. Yeah, and I think one of the things that will that segues nicely into just kind of level setting everyone who either read Watchmen's Rattle way back in 2011 when it came out, or or maybe has never heard of it. Um, our audience is is again looking at the pragmatic ways to not only recognize, but also then, in some cases, arbitrage these these changes, right? And so, uh, whether that be through an investment vehicle or whether that be through how they uh, and run an, an industry with a disruptive new product or solution, right? So, um, so what are some of the things you we talked about? And I'll let you kind of pick the first one top of mind. But there were there were eight super memes basically in in Watchmen's Rattle that begin to show up when society is getting to this level of complexity that it can no longer comprehend, right? Um, some of these uh, may be more apropos now, but what are ways that someone can recognize that where these are things are happening and then make start to make strategic decisions around what they spend their time understanding and adapting to, because we only have so much time to adapt and we have to pick priorities. So what are some of the super memes that are most relevant today? And, and, and then what, what are they telling us to well, adapt? The, the, the biggest one is a confusion between what's an empirical fact and what's an unproven belief. There's so much information on the internet that for everything that you, every, paper that you find or any research you find that says one thing, you'll find 10 that say the exact opposite. So most people are not scientists. They can't really go through and look at the veracity, right, and the methodologies used and analyze all those things in order to know, well, is that a fact or is that someone's opinion? Or worse yet, even standards in science are declining. Right. I, I think it was uh, I can't remember. It was one of the pharma big pharma companies uh, did an analysis of um, published papers in uh, in, a, in the Med uh, American Medical Journal. And they found out that something like 60 percent or, or even it might have been 70 percent of the studies that had been published could not be replicated. Now, Replication is a fundamental uh, requirement in science. And when you get to the point where 60 or 70 percent of the of the research can't be replicated, you've even got standards in science eroding. So, you know, people being confused about, well, what's a real fact on which I can base an, a, a, a logical and rational decision and what's an unproven belief or something I just read on the Internet? That's a confusion that everybody is going through at the exact same time. It's not limited to just business leaders or those who are looking at how to invest their portfolios. Uh, that, that level of complexity is creating a consternation in which people do not have a grasp of the facts anymore. And they can't take a day off of work to try to investigate it. And even if they could, they probably don't have the skill set to look and see what is valid. So that creates a big problem. And that means that for the most part, we're all making very, very important decisions based on 0.0000000% right, of the available data that we should be considering in making those decisions. We, we have such a minuscule amount of information out of the entire set of available information on which we're basing even public policy decisions, let alone individual financial decisions and, and business decisions. So that's that's that kind of puts everything into context. So, so now if it's okay, I want to move on to, well, okay, what do we do? Right. Okay, if that's, if I buy into that, Rebecca, and you know, I got a, I, the whole watchman's rattle is about this. If that is really the situation, and you're saying that that you know, we we have so little data, we're making irrational decisions, we're not using that data, so what do you do? That's why I wrote the second book on, called On the Verge, uh, because the real solution happens to be leveraging technology tools like artificial intelligence. The fact is, is all of this data has now allowed us to string together algorithms 
that are getting more and more accurate at predicting outcomes which haven't even happened yet. And that's really where we are. All this data can be used now to analyze uh, in, in a predictive way what's going to happen. And so most of what I write about is predictive analytics and the effect that that's really having on business leaders and government leaders today. And if it's okay with you, I'll just give you a really easy yeah. example of that. Yeah. So the largest retailer in the United States, when they found out that cows produce less milk, when the temperatures start to go up, they began tapping into uh, NOAA and NASA's uh, weather um, uh, database and looking for when the temperatures were predicted to start going up. And they began negotiating and locking in milk prices ahead of all their competitors so that when the milk shortages began to set in, they had a, a noticeable price advantage. And in that way, these predictive models are becoming very, very accurate and very certain and allowing those people who have those predictive algorithms to get the jump ahead of everybody else. And it's going to create a very predatory environment. Data will create a predatory environment. And that's what I think business and government leaders have to get ready for. Well, I think that's the I think that's the important thing is that, you know, um, those opportunities will always create a, uh, a a strong advantage for one set of people who a have the awareness, b the capitalization and the tools to deploy, and then the impacts though create another set of challenges, opportunities, which are you know retail investors, for example, are they have no shot at this point, right? Like the the dark hole, the the quantification that large funds can deploy just. It, it makes me, um, as the average investor, you know, completely basically David and Goliath without a without a slingshot. Um, so, talk to us about the flip side of that. Like, predatory is fine; that that happens in every major shift. But how do we how do we make sure that with seven and a half, seven and a half, almost eight billion people by you know twenty twenty one or whatever it's going to be that um, that we're we're bringing humanity forward. Uh, in in a way that is a, is is equitable. I'm not talking about leveling a playing field just because. I'm I'm saying avoiding um, you know these gaps that are continuing to get wider that are ultimately unsustainable. Because I don't believe anybody wants to live in a high rise surrounded by AK-47s, right? Um, to keep themselves safe. So talk to us a little bit about like you know the other side, the pragmatic everyday ways that predictive analytics can serve a broader set of humanity? Because I know you've got use cases there as well. Well, as an example, just yesterday, you know, I was talking to uh, the founders of the Human Vaccine Project, right? So that's a nonprofit. And uh, what they're trying to do is um, become a global consortium for all the information that's available in various pockets around the world about the human immune system. It turns out that vaccines don't work very well. They're very difficult to produce, right? They're very labor intensive to produce and they work about 10 to 20% of the time. And most of the time, which is a kind of an odd thing, you can take a vaccine and, and, and it will work 80% of the time in the United Kingdom and it will only work 10% of the time in Uganda. Now, you would think, well, human physiology is basically the same. No, it isn't. Vaccines don't work the same, and sometimes they don't work at all. In fact, most, most of the time they don't work at all. And flu vaccines are a bit of a joke. As a scientist, I can say that. And, you know, a lot of people write in and say, are you kidding me? No. Most of the time they don't really do anything. So I, yeah, I've never taken one. Of and, and frankly, vaccines are, uh, all the vaccines we've developed are disease specific. Now. If the human body, in most of the cases, is able to fend off these diseases, they don't need to be disease specific. There should be vaccines that boost the immune system to fight off a large plethora of diseases. We shouldn't need to fight off smallpox in a different way than we fight off HIV or we fight off other, other diseases. So we, we don't quite have a grasp on the human immune system. And so what these people are doing is they're gathering all of the data, which is a massive data set. And they're trying to say, 
the purpose of vaccines is to boost the immune system, the human immune system for all diseases, but we don't understand how the immune system works. So we've got to decode it just like the human genome. And we know what the human decoding the human genome did to medical science, right? Yep. So once we decode the human immune system, it's going to completely disrupt science as we know it. And 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 treatment for for a variety of diseases from Alzheimer's to flus. Now, how can how do we do that? How do we do that? We have to use predictive analytics and artificial intelligence. There's no other way to do it. The data sets are too big. So we can't we can't solve this very, very big, you were talking about, you know, issues that affect all of humanity. We can't solve this very huge problem, right, of why we get diseases and die until we decode the human immune system. And we can't do that without artificial intelligence and using predictive models. Well, and I would also say the other how is we have to flip the incentives, understanding that massive institutions from the FDA to the pharmaceutical industry have zero interest in one vaccine that builds our immunity when they can make billions of dollars and have built their whole pipelines of innovation around. Um, they don't actually make a lot of money on vac vaccines specifically. They don't make a lot of money on them. They're hard to produce. There's actually only a couple of companies that actually manufacture vaccines. They're hard to produce. They have to be produced in small quantities. Pharma doesn't really like vaccines right now. Yeah. And the fact is, it's not pharma that's going to invest in the Human Vaccine Project because the Human Vaccine Project is a nonprofit and open source. So there's no IP incentive there, right? I mean, everybody's going to get the data. So uh, that's what pharma companies don't like. Everybody gets the data. There's well, no it, profit there. Yeah, I think, okay, so I'm glad. The reason why I pressed on that is because I wanted to understand it, but I also wanted to illuminate their model because... Um, the, the nonprofit and the open standards, open source model, uh, you know, obviously in a whole different world, the, the largest technology acquisition ever uh, was an open ha uh, source one uh, just two months ago with Red Hat being acquired for 34 billion. Um, you know, I, I think that open source, open standards are part of this next level of new institution creation. And, and but we uh, don't have an economic model for that. Let's be clear. Yeah. The old economic models don't really work when you go to open source. They don't really work for things like Bitcoin either. Right. So somehow new economic models that are more humanitarian friendly, right, and allow everybody to use the same information, right, uh, where there's not proprietary IP. Yeah. In my view, a lot of these things that are proprietary, right, um, are going to begin to shift away. They're going to get, you know, it's like termites. Technology is eating away at them. This idea that we have patents here in the United States that China doesn't observe and other countries don't care. Right. Right. right? So patents really aren't don't protect you anymore. That's the reality. Right. So there again. Here's the fact, and here's the unproven belief. The unproven belief is I'll file for a patent, spend a lot of money defending my patent, and and the and the fact is the rest of the world doesn't care. Right. Well, right. The They're gonna. What are you gonna do? Go after every person on the internet in India and China and Africa who's violating your your patent? Yeah, absolutely. You're and not gonna do it. My yeah. brother has a small automotive safety company called company called Factor 55. And he started on the top of his garage and he's made a, a really successful company out of it. And at least once a month, he calls me up in a rage that someone has ripped off his patent and is selling a cheap knockoff and damaging his brand, <laughs> which is a high end brand. And he said, I paid all of this money, you know, and now I got to pay more money to lawyers to try to go after them. And I said, uh, yeah, welcome to the globalization. Right. <laughs> so yeah. 
Now the the idea, so everything that we do with you know digital sense and and my next book rebooting retail is is talking about everything's a commodity. There's no product in any industry right now that I could invent and you could knock off 24 hours later. And there you go. Where we differentiate is now on this customer experience, you know, buzzword. But where we differentiate is the relationship we have with a ever more promiscuous customer. And we're not going to go into that on this thread. But you're you're speaking to the fact that. As we look at the shifts from the the current economy to the next economy, and these institutions that are collapsing, meaning they'll be replaced by something simpler, you know, I always go out on my soapbox and just talk about human to human. We're selling stuff to each other. There is no B two B. There is no B two C. If you want to get simple, understand the pain points and the journey that a human being is on, and put your brand in a conversation with them and your product solution in a dynamic way to deliver that. And technology can help you do that in ways it never was. And you can unlock, as a collective, we can now unlock another three to four billion people that have never had a chance to participate because now they've all got one of these. In the That's right. That's Even right. So that, that kind of brings us to another subject, right? Where, where we were talking about all these institutions are going to have to collapse and and go away because they're really not relevant in a global economy. You know, everybody has been up in arms and, and particularly Wall Street's been up in arms for months about the tariff war with China, yeah. right? And everybody's all concerned that we're in these tariff wars with everybody and, you know, how's that going to shake out? But at the end of the day, the only fair tariffs are no tariffs because the consumer doesn't want to be blocked from buying a, ch a, a cheaper Chinese good. They don't want to be blocked from buying from India or Africa or wherever they want to shop. And the internet has made it possible for them to shop anywhere they can get the best product for the best price. And so when you start to put these tariffs on things, it, it just doesn't work. It's, it's inconsistent with where technology has brought the consumer. The consumer wants freedom of choice best product for lowest price. Anything that gets in the way of that is really kind of old and needs to be abandoned, including tariffs. So imagine a world where every country, similar to nuclear disarmament, right? The dream of nuclear disarmament. Let's imagine tariff disarmament, right? Where every country drops their tariffs, zero tariffs on any goods going out or going in. That's the fair playing field the consumer wants. Right. Right? So this is where public policy gets out of step with technology and gets out of step with how consumers are behaving. To your point, follow the journey the consumer is on. Follow the journey the person is on. And if you follow that, technically, public policy should be consistent with that. But what we have now is a sort of a trifurcation. Technology is moving in a certain area and it's outstripping human beings. We have humanity moving in a certain area and then we have government and public policy moving in an area. And this is why I say there will be a correction. Right. There'll be a correction because those things ought to be moving together. So let's, yeah, so let's, um, let's shift gears in a, in a, parallel direction though to that because um, you brought up something else as it relates to AI, predictive analytics, kind of sewing some of these things together that you talked about and on the verge. Um, in the green room before we were broadcasting, you told me that you were bad at one thing, which is retiring. And, uh, and so... I'm trying, Chris. I'm trying to retire. Oh. I, I feel like the godfather. They keep pulling me back in. Yeah. The way it's hard when you when you uh, when you have a brain like yours, it's pretty hard to uh, stop uh, solving uh, problems or looking at data. So, I don't anticipate you're going to be uh, too successful at retiring anytime in the next couple of years. But I wish you the best. Um, so the you know the thing that I wanted to transition to was as it relates to some of those things, um, we're looking at a a shift in a collapse of work. This this notion of the future of work, right? Which we've kind of had this industrial age and then peppered on top of that, the information age, but really that that was an extension and kind of a globalization of the the old work models and the old institutional uh, way that we thought of work. Um, and, and so as that has hit a point of, you know, 
future collapse and we're going to see 50 percent of the repetitive jobs in industries that people may have thought never would lose their job lawyers you know accountants insurance people um, as those things all become automated and more efficient and to the point to your point just then more customer centric what do we do and and what is the impact on uh, happiness and some of these other things and so I, I I bring that up because we're going to have I believe a renaissance and one of the most enlightening periods of work uh, over the next maybe de decade to 20 years that humanity's ever seen because humans are for questions computers are for answers as Gerd Leonhard likes to say and uh, this will buy us new time but you've done some interesting data dives and I know this is related to the project you're currently working on around what how to quantify happiness and what triggers it or what doesn't and and some of the issues of of being out of work as it relates to that so tell us a little bit about that as we kind of wind down um this this segment well as you know my my recent project i'm not you know i, I have to admit i may have finally chris taken on a a project that i won't be able to complete <laughs> <laughs> but you know i i i figured what better project than something that you're not that you're just absolutely uncertain you can do you right. know those are projects that that interest me the most and that i like to sink my teeth into and so my latest project is to look at how all of this technology and all of this consternation is affecting human happiness and what got me started on this is the increase in mass violence that's going on pandemic depression and people on antidepressants um I, I just, and, and the largest population going on antidepressants are youth and, right. uh, and, and then global addiction. And, you know, we, we seem to be just sort of trending in a really negative direction. And so I thought, well, as an evolutionary biologist, what, what really is going on here? And so that got me interested in the things that we know permanently affect your capacity to be a happy human being. And I wanted to know what research was available on there. And, and it turns out that there's some really um, bulletproof research that unemployment, to your point, is one of those things that can take our set range of happiness. We each have a set range that we operate from. Yeah. This has been proven by studying um, uh, twins that have been separated by birth and also Harvard longitudinal studies that have looked at people's lives over 75 and 80 years. Uh, and and th these are long-term uh, clinical studies that, that are, uh, uh, have had the best minds in the world working on them. And it turns out that uh, one of the things that can take your natural set point from which you operate, a way to think about it is uh, the way atoms can get excited, but they always return to their steady state because that steady state can be stabilized and is uh, uh, and 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 can be sustained. Yeah. We have a steady emotional state, each of us. It's kind of a natural range in which we're comfortable operating. And uh, what's interesting is there are very few things that have been proven scientifically to lower that steady state range for the rest of your life. And one of those things is any prolonged period of unemployment. You never rebound back to the levels of happiness you were able to achieve prior to that unemployment. I don't think a lot of people know that. I certainly didn't know that. What is the and time when, I, when I learned that and I figured all these millennials that got out of college and were unable to find jobs, what we effectively did was we damaged their capacity to be happy. We lowered it for the rest of their lives. And by the way, this is the bad news. We don't actually have tools and know how to raise it again, raise it back to levels that it was prior to the un to unemployment. We don't know how to do that yet. So we don't have enough data. Another way to say that is it may be that finding work in the future that has meaning beyond just the ability to obviously uh, compensate them in a way that lives a life that they enjoy, which I know there's a lot of data to support where that's a diminishing return and where it's also uh, a, a major lift to happiness. But we just don't have enough data either on that data set of people that have lost work and, and been permanently damaged in, in one way 
to understand how much of that they can claw back if over the next 10 to 20 years there is. They can't. They can't. That's the answer. Economists have studied over longitudinal studies. They have studied this phenomenon. And, and so it's no surprise that those countries that consistently rank the happiest in the world, according to the United Nations, uh, you know, happiest countries in the world, those countries that consistently rank the happiest in the world have almost zero unemployment. Yeah. It turns out those two things go hand in hand. It, and it's not just unemployment. They also happen to be the countries that have the, you know, don't have as, as big of a, a, a income divide between the wealthiest and the least wealthy. Right. Um, and so, yeah, and so that, that income gap, uh, that wealth gap is also much narrower in those countries. We, we do have a lot of data, but to your point, as we move more and more into robotics and automation, and, and there are fewer and fewer jobs for people to take, are we going to see dramatic rises in depression mass violence, mental illness, you know, what effect is this going to have on human happiness? And this is really where I, you know, I don't like to write books that are doom and gloom. You know that about me. Right. Um, so even though I've kind of had to go to a dark place, the good news is we know very specific things that people can do that choices and attitudes that can change people's happiness. Now, is it going to compensate for the unemployment? I don't know. I don't know. I'm just speaking honestly with you. I don't know because I'm in the middle of researching this book right now. I don't know how many things you can choose to do that will, that will counterbalance the negative effects that certain events in life have and their, and their ability to lower your set range of happiness. So, you know, that's, I, I, it's kind of a nail biter for me right now because I'm just collecting all the data and analyzing it. And I don't know where I'm going to come out on the back end. Well, it's, it's, it's a really interesting thing to know that you're out there doing that. As, as I told you, when I found that out just a couple minutes before this broadcast, because the token standard is really about, the token economy and understanding the new standards, the new the new set of rules, the new opportunities, and the new unknowns that we face in this what what I believe we're in is the fifth uh, version of a market economy. But tokenization is not something new. This isn't about crypto. It's not about blockchain. Tokenization is merely taking you know sensitive data and putting it into a un a, a unsensitive container so that you can port it and move it and transact with it safely around the world. And so PCI compliance is a form of tokenization. But as we talk about everything, data being the new oil, and, and I would call it the new unrefined oil, um, Cisco's study in 2016 uh, talked about how this year, 2018, and I think it, it's actually a little bit more than this, but I couldn't find it, that 400 zettabytes, which is 400 trillion gigabytes, or a gigabyte every 10 minutes for every human being that walks on this planet in exhaust, yeah. data exhaust, that's the waste. That's stuff we did nothing with, to your point about humans can't, there's no human being or collective set of us that'll ever be able to quantify that data. Only AI and only machines can do that. And that's only gonna compound, right? So 400 trillion gigabytes this year is gonna be whatever the heck it's gonna be next year. It's gonna be a lot more. It isn't gonna go up incrementally as we know. But and how so, is that affecting us? Well, how, so- How are we going to use it, right? right. To, to our advantage, right? To better humanity? to get ahead of competitors in business? How are we going to use it? Who's and going to have access to it? And is it going to make us happier? Well, and how are we gonna unlock new forms of work? Meaning uh, I, work is designed to give me meaning in my life, but it has also pragmatically always been a way to sustain myself economically in a market system, right? And so we have to deal with, and I know there's all the debate around you know, universal incomes and things like that. But my thing is, is if we knew we had oceans of oil, because everyone understands oceans of oil have value somewhere, right? If we had oceans of oil underneath us right now, all we'd be thinking about is how we're going to get it out of the ground and who we're going to sell it to and, and what that's going to mean from a sustainability of our, uh, our, our, our local economy. It, what we're saying is that with 400 trillion gigabytes, 400 zettabytes of data exhaust, we are, we are oceans of oil data we are oceans of but we have to figure out how to put a universal value around us 
uh, we're, we have to figure out how to secure and create sovereign identities and mesh governance and things like that. But we have the raw materials for a whole new economic system, as you were mentioning earlier. We just haven't defined what that needs to be and how it needs to move. But I think if we connect it to the thing we all understand, which is happiness, and we, we can not go down the road of, oh, that's a soft skill or that's unquantifiable, you're saying, no, I'm going to spend probably way more time than I'll ever have just looking at the quantifiable data around happiness. So it we is have a lot of quantifiable data. It's just not out there in the mainstream and it's not doing the work that it needs to do. If you know, if you know statistically that your odds of leading a happy life go up if you choose A over B, yep. then you have the ability now to make an intelligent, informed decision. I've never, I didn't have that opportunity because this had never been compiled. This had never been put together for me. So what I'm hoping to do is to be able to put together a compilation of all of the hard data, the best research that we have, so that we can look at it and say, I'm, A is better than B for me, but it doesn't necessarily mean I'll choose A. Just your personal happiness is not the only consideration that you should ever you know, take into account in making a decision. But you should have the data, particularly if science already knows. If science already knows that unemployment will lower your set range and your potential for happiness for the rest of your life, that puts a whole new spin on why employment is important. It's not only because you people deserve, you know, have the right to make a living and need to eat and, and provide shelter for their children and so on and so forth. It's not only a matter of that. It's a matter of if you don't have em employment, what happens to people's happiness and what happens to people who are unhappy? What do they do? Right. Suicide rates are up. Depression is up. Mass violence is up. We're headed in the wrong direction because we're not paying attention to the empirical data that we have that says that these choices that people make, make them happier or make them very unhappy and sometimes for the rest of their life. And I think we need to get that data out. And so whether I'll be, it's a massive data set. <laughs> Believe me, I wish I had some quantum computers right <laughs> with artificial intelligence but i'm just kind of working my way through it. you know how i am i'm, I'm, I'm a stubborn gal it may and be I'm working my way through it one paper at a time well we may we may be something we should uh, offline collaborate on as it relates to our ice research uh, lab that we're putting in sweden um in q1 and maybe it's a maybe it's a project that we need to uh, align some resources around and, and work with you on so we can we can we can look at that a little deeper because i think I think that it is a very interesting and important um, uh, input to to the people that are leading and making decisions, both policy wise and also um, enterprise wide, on on what the future of work inside their organization is. And, and can I just tell you one thing? As I as I uncover each of these, I've started to do them, and I'm happier. Yeah, I'm but sure. I'm yeah, sure. there's been a sort of an unexpected byproduct of writing this book on happiness in that I'm sort of following what the data says. And the by, the unintended byproduct is that I'm actually a lot happier. Well, you know, I, I think it's funny that I can't quantify this outside of my own experience either. But I will tell you, and, and as we wind down here, I, I can't thank you enough for being who you are and doing the work that you do, but also blessing... Uh, our audience and future replay audience of this with with you know 45 minutes of your wisdom and time and energy um, but I, I will tell you that you know part of these talks and us doing this kind of thing is last year I think I was on the road to 27 different events I, I was in 13 countries and um, and it was an important kind of investment of time but I came back from DC this last weekend and I, it was the last event I'm doing this year, and it's probably the last event I'm going to travel to that's not ours um, for for a while. Because what I realized is that you know what makes me happy is helping to uncover and discover the ideas of people like you. But what does not make me happy is grinding through conferences and and waving speaker fees down to make it work for the organizers and 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 do the economic thing 
um, because it doesn't get the information out there any better or different necessarily. It's an important input to one degree, but this is this is us too looking at how to simplify the business and leverage technology to um, to be happier and bring the ideas to more people. So uh, I, I I definitely think there's something there. I would be one of the first people to read it, but that's because I read all your stuff. Um, <laughs> I'm biased. Anyway, well, thank you. I'll, I'll only... let you know if I if I actually get the manuscript pulled together right now. Like I said, I'm kind of uh, is. I told myself I'm too. The way I described it is. Um, I'm, I'm too far to turn back and I'm too far from the other side. So yeah. there's only one thing to do, lay on my back and start kicking. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to get land. <laughs> yeah, I want to give you the chance to say one more thing to the audience uh, and, and close us out that I'm going to, um, I'm going to acknowledge one of the, uh, one of the listeners, um, Stephen McGee, just because he's been like crazy, uh, sharing links and, and engaging in the chat. And so um, we'll put that in the show notes, Stephen. I want to thank you for your attention specifically because you've been you've been going crazy in the chat in a good way for us. And so, Rebecca, why don't you uh, give us one parting thought, and then I'm going to throw up next week's teaser, and we're going to be out. Okay. Well, I guess my parting thought would be this. It's a very complex time to be a leader of any type. And uh, I wouldn't blame – the worst thing we can do is blame ourselves – for the errors that we make, I would say forgive yourself very quickly for any mistakes that you make, move on as quickly, fail fast, move on as quickly as possible, and wherever possible, even if it means collaborating with others, try to use the greatest tools that we have right now, which are artificial intelligence and predictive analytics to predapt, not adapt, to pre-dapt to what we know is coming and headed our way. Awesome. Thank you. I couldn't have said it any better. Guys, uh, that was that was episode one and uh, set a big standard for the rest of them. Next week, we've got Oz Sultan. We will look forward to having you on there. If you want, you can hit subscribe and you'll just get the updates automatically for future webinars and replays. Next week, we'll be talking about regulation, cybersecurity, and blockchains with a man who uh, is a Muslim living in New York and who began fighting terrorism uh, through Bitcoin and cryptocurrency research back in 2013 after an unfortunate incident in a restaurant. So do not miss next week with Oz Sultan, one of my dear friends. Rebecca, thank you for being here and we will see you guys next time.